Hello and welcome to episode 137 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, it's not just natural gas that comes from Russia, so does the specialized uranium used in small modular nuclear reactors. Oopsie! The European Union has officially banned new combustion cars in 2035. Now if only they could ban the Eurovision Song Contest. A large multinational bank is getting scolded for greenwashing. Brian, I'm old enough to remember when multinational bank greenwashed when a Brian, I'm old enough to remember when a multinational bank greenwashed it meant laundering money for criminals. According to the IEA, carbon emissions will peak in 2025. They also said our podcast peaked in 2020, which I thought was kind of me. Why do they keep studying us? Anyway, all that and more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. And welcome everyone to our weekly podcast on climate and clean energy. If you're new, be sure to subscribe to get all of our episodes delivered to you weekly. More on this show, Brian, we have uh, is Twitter's owner, C, uh, Elon Musk, is Twitter owner Elon Musk damaging Tesla's brand? The answer is yes. Uh, will British PM Sunak attend COP27 and will King Charles be jealous? Answer is also yes. Well, I'm spoiling everything. SMRs <laughs> have a geopolitical problem thanks to Russia invading Ukraine. Poland boshed its nuclear ambitions and is now letting foreigners run the show. And how Africa can benefit uh, even more than the rest of the world by installing renewables. And and that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. All kinds of stuff we're going to talk about this week. So much stuff to do. So one thing I wanted to catch up on, which I just sort of mentioned off the cuff last week, we somehow started talking about... Um, a transatlantic cruise. I, something I've always wanted to do is take a cruise across the Atlantic rather than airplane because it would be, you know, sort of old-fashioned and fun and, you know, less stressful than plane travel. Uh, I've always wanted to do it, but, you know, I had done some Googling and it turns out, in terms of a carbon footprint, it you know, taking a ship across the Atlantic is worse than flying. And, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to follow up because I, I didn't sort of cite any sources last week because I just kind of mentioned it off the cuff. But yeah. um, if anyone wants to Google that, there's sort of a few articles here, but there's one from The Guardian that's way back from 2006, and it quotes uh, Climate Care, which is a carbon offsetting company, and they calculated it at 0.43 kilograms of CO2 per passenger mile on a cruise ship and only 0.25 for a long-haul flight. So 0.43 versus a 0.25 for airplane travel. So yeah, it does appear that that taking a ship, one of those big cruise ships anyway, like maybe you could stow away on like a cargo ship that's going anyway. Yeah. I mean, that'd probably be, you know. Well, they, but, put, you know, they if, put swimming pools on those ships, multiple oh, swimming pools, all I kinds of I started getting ads on my uh, social media. So they, they've got a go-kart track on the top of one of these cruise ships. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Jeez, um, I'd like that. Hopefully there's a barrier so you don't uh, fly off into the ocean. Yeah, but that would be yeah it's, you know, a cruise ship, it's like you're moving basically a small city yeah. um, across the ocean. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised that it's worse in terms of carbon emissions. And then also possible, like they sometimes do things like burn their waste. Yeah. Because um, they've got so much waste on a ship and, you know, things like that are not good. We should have done something on a sustainable Halloween because it was Halloween last night. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's your favorite Halloween candy? <laughs> You're not known for your sweet tooth. I'll say that. Um, yeah, I have you yeah, know. What did you yeah, steal I, from the kids, Brian? Come on, be honest. Well, we had some like Swedish berries that were pretty good. Those are good, aren't they? Yeah. They yeah. they do really ring the bell in the old brain, don't they? They 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 are <laughs> they're, they're they're nice. And so are a lot of things. Uh, my least favorite is Smarties. I have a box right here. Oh, I like Smarties. You do you're the guy who likes Smarties. Yeah, Smarties, yeah. I looked this up yesterday. Is at the bottom of the preferred candy lists all right. over the internet. At the bottom, Brian. Wow, and wow. I like Smarties. You like Smarties. And I'm going to yeah. eat them right now out of, uh, not spite, but uh, because I have to. Um, and also, I will point out, you know the, the candy that uh, we call Rockets, the little sugar candy? Yeah. Rock In America, those are known as Smarties. What? Yeah. They don't have Smarties like we have Smarties. Really? Yeah, Smarties here in Canada are kind of vaguely like an M&M. &M. It's just a chocolate-covered, uh, candy-covered chocolate. In, in different colors, but, um, you know, they're not very good. 
Uh, <laughs> the M and M's. I will tell you, this is a knowledge that I have deep knowledge of candy. Have ground up peanuts in the shell, which is oh. why you cannot, if you have a peanut allergy, eat M and M's chocolates. Uh, right. These do not, and I really notice the, the the flavor difference. Like they have a flavor to their shell in mm -hmm. the M and M's, but. Do you see M&M's very much? No. Um, we <laughs> we had a lot of hell. Did you have trick-or-treaters? Did you do that? Yeah, just uh, maybe a couple of dozen. Well, that's pretty good. Um, my son was texting me all night from his uh, great uncle's house in the town where he goes to university. And his uncle, who's um, 83, and his twin lives in Regina, is very close to us, uh, his uh, sister. And he was giving out... He didn't give it on anything last year, so when my son was there, so my son was kind of wondering what Uncle Gary gives out. Christmas oranges. He gives out oranges. Interesting. And my son was very upset by this. <laughs> <laughs> but then it got worse because uh, then Uncle Gary made him hand out the oranges and accept uh -oh. the wrath from the kids. <laughs> How embarrassing. So <laughs> apparently there was a meme to give out potatoes, so people were giving out potatoes this year. You know, we always did that as a, as a joke. We had some potatoes lying around, and we said we should give those out. Uh, well, I uh, the, the thing is, Brian, people are are paranoid. Even when we were kids, about Chris or you know Halloween candy, rather. Yeah. And those oranges are going into the landfill. Yeah, probably. Maybe one in twenty will be eaten. Mm -hmm. I bet you most of them will be thrown out because, especially when they're handed to a long haired teenager, uh, and there's already reports of. Uh, marijuana gummies uh, getting into the Halloween supply in Winnipeg. Yeah. News. I'm sure it's possible, although they're kind of expensive. That's kind of an expensive... Is that uh, maybe it's, you, you get high, you make mistakes, Brian. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, and the other thing I wanted to mention is um, I've got another Tesla appointment in Saskatoon on Friday. I'm starting to have troubles with the heat again. It, it, something like that kind of happened last winter where it seemed like it was not blowing enough heat. But it never put up an error warning or anything, so I was never able to kind of get it fixed. But now there's a little error warning, so I got to make the drive up to Saskatoon on Friday to see what's up with that. Did you Google the error warning to see what uh, it was? Nope. No, I didn't. It just said climate keeper not available due to system fault. So there's some kind of system fault, and uh, they're going to see me on Friday. Well, we've had above normal weather, but it's going to cool down, and um, you know, good yeah, luck. With it's going to be. Very cold very soon. So Is it not I wanted working to get that. at all? Uh, it works for a little while, and then you're driving around, and then suddenly it's blowing cold air. Uh, that's going to be an unpleasant five hours of driving then. It, potentially, yeah. The temperature's kind of dropping a bit by Friday, so we'll see. It, you know, it kind of comes and goes, so hopefully, uh, you know, I'll dress warm. Uh, yeah, I should say so. Let's see. What, what's the Friday forecast here? Checking the <laughs> weather here. And uh, to see if Brian's going to be available for next week's show. So this is a scheduling issue here that we're looking at. Will Brian be dead? Friday. Oh, five. Plus uh, five? Plus five Celsius and sunny. Yeah. So the fun. sun really makes a difference. Is it the middle yeah. of the day you're going or? Mm, I haven't decided if I'm going to go the day before or not. Oh, because you're going to make a trip out of it. Hit the restaurants, the museums. <laughs> Everything's in your retirement is is a tourist activity. It's just yeah, totally. Even when you're snowed in, it's like, well, oh, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I got nowhere to be. It must be good. Um, well, let's get on with the show. I hate oranges in my Halloween candy. It weighs you down. I probably would have thrown them at the house myself. But um, <laughs> the big discussion topic this week is Elon Musk because he is the head of Twitter. And he was the head of, and is the head of um, Tesla. Now, Tesla is an important company in the energy transition. And we've been following every eye glitch of Musk for 20 years. Yeah. And now he's gone off the rails, I think. Um, I'm just going to hit this uh, clip here from uh, Colbert. He's going to explain it if you haven't been paying attention. I'll have a comedian instead of a news clip. The discourse in America is about to get way worse thanks to new Twitter CEO Elon Musk. <laughs> Musk took uh, over the Twitter on Friday and immediately there was an explosion of hate speech including the use of the N-word on the platform which jumped 500 percent 
leading Twitter to change the landing page from what's happening to what's happening? Because <laughs> yesterday, Musk replied to a tweet from Hillary Clinton about the attack on Paul Pelosi that condemned the violence and conspiracy theories with a link to a homophobic conspiracy theory blaming the victim of the violence. That's not just awful. That is beyond the pale. And so is Elon Musk. It's her, you know, bathing picture of Elon on the beach. But anyway, Very uh, my point is, as you can hear from the audience, he's becoming not a happy, popular guy anymore. Used to be no one knew who he was. Right, right. I bet when you bought your first Tesla stock, uh, 99 out of 100 people wouldn't know who he was practically. Or, you that know, maybe be, not yeah. that extreme, but a lot of people didn't know who he was. Yeah. And now he's a villain. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know, it's almost like let Trump on Twitter so that uh, Musk is not the biggest villain. So my question to you is, as a loyal fan who has not broken down yet and has total faith in Elon, when's your faith going to crumble? What's well, it going to take? Is he going to have to invade Poland? What's going to happen? I wouldn't say I have faith in Elon. I have faith in Tesla. Like the 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 mission of the company is solidly on track. They're they're doing great. I don't know. It it's not like this is going to derail what Tesla is doing. What happens if he starts doing crazy things? I know he mentioned in the last uh, conference call for uh, shareholders that he said something about you know in case I go crazy, this is like. Uh, you know, the backup, like like they can take over and do things. So it's almost like he was seeing it coming, but he's getting kind of Kanye. I'm just waiting for, you know, anti-Semitic tweets and then anti-climate tweets. I, I've predicted this for a while. I can see it coming. And, you know, it was like five years ago, I saw an interview with him where he was interviewing a, okay, an attractive woman was interviewing him for a network. And he started flirting with her. And I thought, this is kind of unhinged, especially since, you know, he just ended one marriage and was looking for this. It was about to get his next. And he said, you know, do you know anyone I could date? In the middle of an interview for a business channel. And it was just so bizarre that I started to lose faith in him and started to question. Um, it just makes me nervous. It makes me nervous. So, yeah. And now he's trying to make people with blue ticks on their Twitter account. Um you know, pay $20 a month to have your, your verified account. Well, as we said many times, clean energy is going to win because it's better and it's cheaper. So whether he charges people on Twitter, I don't really see how that affects climate change. Uh, I see it as he's making stupid decisions. And yeah. I'm worried that those stupid decisions could make it into Tesla. And I asked myself, what... I, like I've said this before, what does it mean for Tesla to have a person like go off the rails who's running the company? Are they stable enough now? Does it matter anymore? Does is his uh, ingenuity, his his you know the things that he's developed like you know you know solving problems like uh, it costs too much, so we'll make one giant piece out of one casting machine. We'll build the machine that makes the machine. Um, if that goes away, is Tesla? Still, I mean, if he's, you know, wrapped up in, in, in cellophane somewhere talking to himself, uh, can <laughs> the clean revolution go ahead? That's my question to you. And you say it's probably okay, but I worry about it. Yeah, because clean energy is better and cheaper. So, you know, all this just seems like a distraction. It's not a distraction, though. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. And, you know, here's another thing, Brian, and this is going to be a, a tough one for you. I have less of a desire to own a Tesla than I did two weeks ago. Yeah, and, I think that's true for a lot of people, yeah. And I think that could continue and it could get worse because he's, he's you know, gathering up all this this storm of, of disdain for him that, you know, people could be ashamed to drive a Tesla one day instead of proud of it. And that I worry about because if the company's bottom line is not good, you know, if it slows down, the fact is that's not going to be an issue for a long time because... There's just so much demand, which we talk about every week on our show. Now, I'm blocking anyone who serves me an ad on Twitter because GM said that they were going to stop uh, temporarily serving ads. That didn't last long because I started getting GM ads again. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe it's a maybe it's a Canada U.S. thing. Maybe they're still doing it in Canada. Well, I, it's true. I didn't get any ads at all when he took over Twitter for about two days, and then GM came back on, so I blocked them. And that's the one thing I might actually buy is a GM. 
you know, car, <laughs> right? So they know yeah. that. <laughs> uh, and, and it's just kind of weird because, you know, if everybody who has a blue check mark paid the 20 bucks a month, it'd be like $75 million, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the $5 billion in advertising. So it doesn't matter. So if you drive people like Stephen King off, then... You don't you don't want to talk about this, do you? You really don't well, want to talk about this. There was a funny joke, one of the late night shows that have, I think it was, maybe it was Saturday Night Live. The joke was, um, you know, why is everyone so uh, upset that that Elon Musk could ruin Twitter because it's not like it's this cherished. <laughs> it's already bad. Like it's a cesspool. It's a it's cesspool. A cesspool. Like who cares if he sinks it? <laughs> it's. I mean. All it is now is slightly better than Facebook. Like, that's all you can say about it. Well, I felt less guilty about it since, um, eh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I will give him the benefit of the doubt for a while, and maybe he can clean it up. But so far, so far, his steps are not indicating that that will happen. But, I mean, if he could get rid of bots, that would be a good thing. I mean, bots um, drive the discourse, apparently, some people think. Yeah, well, I don't know. I just, I just think maybe you're getting sucked into the clickbait news cycle. Like it, you know, like everything to do with this is fantastic clickbait. So um, whether it's positive or negative, it's, it's this stuff just generates tons of uh, publicity. I mean, he's only been running it for like three days. Like, what? Why do we all? Well, you know? he fired everybody and appointed himself king. He's yeah, like there all. in the skyscraper by himself in his underwear, yeah. doing God knows and what. And it's still better than Facebook. <laughs> uh, all you have to do is look at Mark Zuckerberg. Um, who would win in a, a, a nude wrestling match, Zuckerberg or Musk? <laughs> I think Zuckerberg would because he's studying martial arts. But anyway. Uh, I'd like to see that a, a tan off. They should do a tan off. <laughs> they should and see who burns the most. Uh, <laughs> get outside of your basement, people. Uh, I got mad. I saw an ad uh, the other day, which apparently, once I researched it, it was been around since June. And I, I think that, yeah, I have seen it before. And I just didn't pay attention. And it's a Nissan ad from the company that makes my EV that I love. And it was the first EV mass produced. But they haven't made one until now. Okay, this is important context. Uh, they started in 2010 making the Nissan Leaf the first mass-produced all-electric vehicle. And just now, you can order, not get, a Nissan Area, which is a small SUV, right? Yeah. Um, so, and the, the guy who came up with that program initially is in jail and where, or sought to be in jail. I can't remember Carlos, so we'll see I, about yeah, that. Carlos going. I think he escaped. I think he's fine. So this is a, an ad that I'm going to play right now with uh, Brie Larson, who I once um, in my sleep proposed to very nice woman, um, doing an ad that I don't care for. In the future, we'll travel to incredible places with the help of magical technology. But what about today? I want my magical future now. I have places to go. I can't wait for what tomorrow will bring. But in the meantime, let's enjoy the ride. Because you don't have any EVs to sell, you moron Japanese company who are guest EVs. So I can't see the pictures for that ad, but presumably there it's a, it's an ad for combustion cars. Well, you don't need to see it. You can hear the car going vroom. Yeah. And mm -hmm. in the beginning, there's flying cars, but that's fantasy electric future. <laughs> that's going to be wonderful. I can't wait for it. But until then, you know, well, the thing is, you and I and our listeners know the then is now. Go out and buy an electric car. You can find one if you try hard enough. And God knows yeah. people do try hard. Uh, we retreated something from Dawn the other day that um, a writer for, I believe, the Toronto Star, or a photographer, uh, went to great lengths. He went the James-like lengths to get an electric car. He went up to campus casing and a long way, and there wasn't even a bus service. He had to, to catch a ride <laughs> to get to a mm -hmm. small town to buy a uh, Chevrolet uh, Bolt EV because they had one in stock. So it was yeah, one of those crazy things. Yeah, still a uh, short supply. It... Um... If you only kind of want an EV, you're probably not going to get one because it's too much work. The Financial Times says that Rishi Sunak has opened the door to a possible U-turn over his decision not to attend next or this month's uh, UN COP27 climate conference uh, in Egypt. Uh, this is growing criticism from Tory MPs about him not going. He said it was pressing business and can't go. Uh, and we have a story about fossil fuels uh, paying him money as well later in the show. So 
I just thought I'd point that out. I also thought I'd throw out that cri uh, Prince, Prince, King Charles wanted to go, and the government wouldn't let him. It's like, mm -hmm. what well, doesn't the king get to do whatever he wants? Yeah, isn't that the whole point of being a king? He says, no, the, your first uh, <laughs> thing should be a big thing, like a trip to Canada. It's like, yeah, screw this. I live in Canada. We don't want you here. Go to the conference. Make an impact. He is going to host something, though. I think we'll cover that in, later in the show, too. And Brian, I wanted to talk about a big feature that I read and listened to in the New York Times from David Wallace Wells. It was a feature in the New York Times Magazine on the weekend. I don't know if you caught it or not, but it was about our climate future and how our climate future is coming into view. Uh, we are starting to know what things will look like based on global warming and based on what we have to fight global warming. So just it says, just ahead of COP27, the climate future looks both better and worse than it did a few years ago. Belated action has made worst case scenarios much less likely, but delay has made best case outcomes impossible too. So where are we headed? And this is a big, big article. And the audio, the audio book eyes it. They, they hired a audiobook type reader to read it. And wow. I'm going to play you a just a clip now. Among energy nerds, the story is well known. But almost no one outside that insular world appreciates just how drastic and rapid the cost declines of renewable technologies have been. That's us. That's us and our listeners. Yeah. We're that insular world. We know what's going on, don't we? We should hire that guy to read our podcast. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Since 2010, the cost of solar power and lithium battery technology has fallen by more than 85%. The cost of wind power by more than 55%. The International Energy Agency recently predicted that solar power would become the cheapest source of electricity in history. And a report by Carbon Tracker found that 90% of the global population lives in places where new renewable power would be cheaper than new dirty power. The price of gas was under $3 per gallon in 2010, which means these decreases are the equivalent of seeing gas station signs today advertising prices of under 50 cents a gallon. The markets have taken notice. This year, investment in green energy surpassed that in fossil fuels. Despite the scramble for gas and the return to coal prompted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. After a decade of declines, supply chain issues have nudged up the cost of renewable manufacturing. But overall, the trends are clear enough that you can read them without glasses. Globally, there are enough solar panel factories being built to produce the necessary energy to limit warming to below two degrees. And in the United States, Planned solar farms now exceed today's total worldwide operating capacity. Liebreich has taken to speculating about a renewable singularity beyond which the future of energy is utterly transformed. So there you have a big long clip from there, and I recommend uh, reading or listening to it on the New York Times. And you know what I can do? I, I have a subscription. So I, I actually, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I know, you know I'm cheap. My listeners know I'm cheap. But I do have a subscription to the New York Times, and I tried to cancel it because I was, you know, saving up my money for other things. And they said, well, how about 50 cents a month? And I said, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I got it down to 50 cents a month. Not bad. For a while, a few years ago, I subscribed to the physical copy of the Sunday New York Times. You can actually get that delivered in our city in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Um, it wouldn't come until, like, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday, <laughs> but you could get, and I think you still can, Get the physical Sunday New York Times delivered to your house. Well, that's pretty cool. It must have been pretty big as well, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah. Huge and thick. And it, it was super fun. It's kind of expensive, so I, did, I didn't only did it for a few months, but it was uh, super fun. Now, I stopped, uh, you know, I, our newspaper here used to be big, and then I got smaller and smaller. Now it's like a leaflet. Yeah. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. just kind of the story <laughs> for local news everywhere these days in the internet era. Anyway, uh, since I have a subscription, I will put out a... They let me put out a, 10 gift links per month. So I will put the oh. gift link in our show notes, which as many people as possible or would like can use, and I'll tweet it out as well. Uh, and if you don't go to the Times on a regular basis, um, I think we give you five articles a month, so it won't even matter. But anyway, I'll do that. So let's get on with the show. Uh, okay, so the European Union has now officially banned combustion vehicles from the year 2035 onwards. Oh, oh, so no... wait, wait, wait. I have yep. to get the oil ban uh, thing going. Oh, sorry. Oil ban. We don't get My to apologies. use that every day, Brian. We, yeah, we should yeah. always have that. 
We got to use the uh, oil. Bag. Okay, so yeah, 2035 onward, no more new combustion vehicles uh, can be sold in the EU, um, uh, which is great. There's another oil ban, uh, but it makes me think of, uh, so I, I knew you were going to talk about Tony Siba later on in the show, uh, prognosticator Tony Siba, who has been predicting the end of fossil fuels for quite some time now. And he's got a couple of new videos out on his YouTube page, if you want to look for them, Tony Siba. But uh, one of the stats that struck me was because of what's going to happen with transportation as a service, which is, you know, like robo taxis uh, or even just electric cars, uh, one of his charts on the new videos, and he's had similar charts to this before, but uh, he thinks by 2030, it's 90 or 95% of miles driven will be electric just by 2030. So um, as I've often wondered, it's like, you know, is 2035 ban even going to do anything? I mean, it, it may be essentially already banned by by 2030 anyway, just because once electric cars exist, and especially if they're autonomous, um, it's, you, you know, you're just going to start driving more miles electric. Just like in our house, we have a gas car and an electric car. Well, we use the electric car way more often. Like once that option is available to people, um, you know, the, the use of, of combustion cars to get around is going to absolutely plummet by 2030. There's an interesting stat that I saw in one of those videos that I hadn't seen before. And it was that the with transportation as a service, now we should explain that maybe. Um, that's like Uber without a driver. So, yep. and you might subscribe like you do to Spotify or to Netflix. You might pay 20 bucks a month. You might pay a hundred bucks a month at first. Yeah. You might pay an annual fee, but you'll get access to that car service whenever you need it to get to the subway station, to get to yep. work, to whatever you want to do. And it should be roughly one tenth the cost of owning a car. And I, I, he pointed out that it would be less than just the price of gas to travel that distance. Yeah. And so without the car, yeah. Without you know the payment on the car or the the charging of the car, uh, it's the all that is less than just the gas for the same car. So, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's quite a disruption and. And I know that many listeners don't believe it, and it's, it is it is hard to believe that it's coming, but it will come, and it's a question of when, and you can argue about that all day. Uh, but I have a story from China that later on that talks about what they are doing, and, um, you know, they're kind of following what Tesla's doing, but with more sensors. We'll get to that later. It's very interesting, and the idea is, uh, I don't know what you pay for your car, but you pay, you know, you have to pay, a, a, well, I don't. I'm not going to get into your personal life, but a lot of people will go and they would, they would have a car payment, okay? Yeah. And they would pay four, five, six, seven hundred dollars a month, depending on yeah. what kind of a car you're buying. Yeah. And then, then you put gas in it. Yep. And you buy insurance. Yeah. And you do maintenance. Yeah. And all that over the course of however you decide to own that, whether you lease it for three years or own it for ten. It is going to cost you X amount of money per month. And that mon that disruption is, it's going to be a lot cheaper to just say, okay, forget it. I'm going to, I'm in Canada. It's, it's minus a thousand out. The car is going to pull up in 30 seconds or two minutes after I punch it in on my app. Uh, and it's going to be warm. I don't have to warm <laughs> it up. It takes me somewhere. I'm not going to get into an accident because it's going to drive perfectly and I'm going to do uh, work. I'm going to surf the web and, and check out what Elon's doing on Twitter because that's very important, or whatever. You know, it's just it's that's the way the future is, and it's it's bound to happen by 2030, and it's bound. Uh, you know, I was reading today. People think that a lot of different companies will probably reach that that threshold at the same time, and you know, it'd be a question of you know who can deploy it the quickest and. Tesla may or may not have an advantage. We'll see on how that works out. You know what we should do, Brian? We should, uh, next spring, a year after we did our uh, automation test in your car, I'm, I think I'm, it's easy for me to say now because, you know, I'm committing to something six months from now. We should do it again. Oh, same, yeah, totally. Same trip and see if, uh, yeah. see how it does. And hopefully the construction's gone. If we went into a construction site with an yeah. open pit, well, somebody actually did that oh, the yeah. other day and, and, and in our city and went into a pit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was very uh, Although not in an autonomous okay. car. Yeah. Not an autonomous car, but they might have been driving pretty stupidly. Autonomous from Probably their mind, texting. Perhaps. 
So SMR fuel is uh, mostly coming from Russia. I saw this in our local newspaper, speaking of our local newspaper or pamphlet. Um, and that is because three provinces in Canada have invested millions, committed millions, or the federal government has committed a lot of millions, stupidly, to small modular reactors, which don't exist except on paper um, for the most part. And the thing about these that this pointed out is th there's a lot of different reactors, okay? Um, but some of them, most of them, require specialized uranium that is high in content. They call it high assay, low enriched uranium, or helium, is the fuel needed for many designs. Now it has, uh, no, it says natural uranium is about 0.7% uranium-235, and helium is, uh, that a lot of these reactors are way up at 20%, so that's many, many times more. And only Russia has that. And guess what? Russia's at war with the world, essentially. Yeah. Well, what about us? We have uranium here in our province. Uh, that stuff's no good. Not that kind of stuff. No, it's no good. It's common uh, blue-collar uranium. It's not the good stuff. <laughs> right. So, but guess what? Our premier here in our jurisdiction said, hey... Uh, we want the reactor that uses our uranium. So that's a different kind of reactor. And the fact that there is all kinds of different kinds of reactors on paper using different fuels just prevents it from ever being close to cost competitive, which is what we argue on the show. And I don't know. It's just, so sanctions against Russia have cut off the supply. So that's delaying this and we we you know the thing about SMRs is that they're going to take a long time and we the the carbon in the atmosphere is filling up like water in a glass and we have to fight that drip as fast as possible and get it down as fast as possible. So you, Canadian uranium mines, um, we we do mine uranium here, but we've never built an enrichment capacity because uh, can do reactors the the reactors that Canada used to build in the eighties and seventies run on fuel that doesn't need enriching. So that's why we don't have it. But Russia does. Huh. So anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. It's one one more check against SMRs overall that, you know, would delay and uh, possibly make them less cost competitive. Well, and that leads us into the next story, which also involves Russia. And this is uh, from The Guardian and uh, the International Energy Agency has uh, released uh, new statistics that say that um, 2025 will be the peak year for carbon emissions. And basically what they say in the report is this is accelerated from what it was uh, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that, that everybody has kind of uh, sped up their plans. Accelerated in a good way, you want to point out. Yeah. That this has moved up. That's right. Yeah. So um, because no one really wants uh, Russia's dirty oil, um, yeah, everyone's plans to accelerate to clean energy. Um, yeah, it, it's all accelerated. And so 2025 is looking like the peak in terms of emissions. You know, every year when the uh, climate conference comes, we get inundated with all these studies and reports and, and it all drops at once. And um, we, we should hire more people next year. That's all I'm saying. It's just... <laughs> This is a big, a lot of stuff to cover. Anyway, um, the uh, UK's Advertising Standards Authority has banned two HSBC advertisements, advertisements for misleading the public about its efforts to tackle climate change. This is a bank. Um, what does HSBC stand for? Well, it was the Hong Kong Bank of something, but I don't know. I think they changed their name. Anyway, they're one of the major banks in the world, and they were... Uh, during the, the climate conference at COP26 in the UK last year, they were advertising things. I've got a picture of it here. It says climate change doesn't do borders and we're great. Uh, the public, you know, so they're misleading the public is what the are accused of about its efforts to tackle climate change. Marking the first time, this is the first time ever the regulator has taken action against a bank for greenwashing. And banks, as you know, Brian, are very important in this, they can't be greenwashing. And basically, this was seen at a bus stop in London and Bristol and other places like that. Uh, and two ads presented as a force for climate good while making no reference to the climate's ongoing commitment to underwriting fossil fuel projects. 
that's the issue. Yeah, well, that's great. I mean, we got to hold people to account when they're just uh, greenwashing. It sucks. It does. And banks, you know, people are, are putting pressure on banks, shareholders and customers uh, and corporations are putting pressure on banks to stop uh, this. And uh, I hate to say it, but, you know, fossil fuels are just, they're fighting a big fight against, you know, losing their power. Mm -hmm. And they have to lose it. They have to, they have to go away as fast as possible. And it's just so much of this is going on that it, you know, I'm glad people are fighting back against it. Yeah. And um, of course, in the midst of all this, we sometimes talk about hydrogen, which is, of course, one of the potential fuels of the future, especially green hydrogen. And we reported a few weeks ago on uh, the first hydrogen trains that are now operating um, in Germany. Anyway, I've come across a new website I've started to read only recently. The website's called Hydrogen Insight, and it's a news site to do with news about um, hydrogen. Um, but I'm still kind of assessing it. I'm a little confused by this website because it, I, I don't know, a lot of the stories seem to be negative about hydrogen. <laughs> so I'm, really? I'm not quite sure what, uh, what's going on there. If anyone knows what hydrogen insight is all about, but, um, and, and not, not to say that like, it, it's not like fake news or anything, like it's, it's a hit piece kind of website or anything, but uh, I just assumed that, that a website called hydrogen insight would be kind of promoting the, uh, hydrogen industry. But anyway, there's, um, the German government has kind of uh, released a report about the cost of this and uh, basically decided that, that they wouldn't do any more hydrogen powered trains because it's not cost effective. So um, the, the different types of trains, so they're saying um, 849 million euros for a hydrogen version of a specific train compared to only 506 million for a battery hybrid or only 588 million euros for a conventional electric train. And a lot of uh, trains in Europe run with, you know, overhead wires uh, uh, electrically. And it turns out that's the cheapest way, which is, again, you know, one of the things we've always kind of wondered about hydrogen. Um, it is a potential part of the solution, but is it cost effective? And it turns out in terms of um, trains, it's not. And like other new technologies that we may or may not need, it's going to take a while yeah. to become cost effective if it does, yeah. if it ever has even a chance to. And, but right now what we'd have to do is replace bad hydrogen with green hydrogen and work on that for the next 10 years and, and get uh, green hydrogen to replace anywhere where we use uh, regular hydrogen or, you know, fossil fuel generated hydrogen, such as uh, cement plants and, uh, fertilizer production, stuff like that. Yeah, and presumably these costs will improve over time and the hydrogen will get cleaner over time. But if you can just build an electric train, uh, you know, maybe you just do that. So Poland is looking elsewhere for nuclear plants. Uh, this is from the German news agency DW. After years of shelved plans to build a civil nuclear capacity in Poland from scratch, the energy crunch caused by the war in Ukraine... Uh, and lower gas supplies from Russia and lack of intermediate, uh, immediate renewable substitutes have kicked the issue back up to the political agenda. So Poland is likely to choose the United States engineering firm Westinghouse Electric to build its first nuclear power plant and provide 49% equity financing for the project. State-owned Korea Hydro Nuclear Power uh, may also be involved. So Korea in the United States in a separate and parallel private nuclear project. However, Brian, Greenpeace has uh, been speaking out against this and uh, says the issue of costs piled on unrealistic expectations on issues of financing based on unrealistic expectations of market changes delivers in the end an unfinanceable project. So they don't think that this will be financed without government paying for it. And that's kind of the issue of nuclear these days is private financing, private investment is not there for it, and then nobody wants to do it. Uh, so it's incumbent upon governments to do it, or you and I taxpayers, and that's not, in our view, a good thing. So uh, Greenpeace goes on, but at a certain moment, it will hit a wall, and there is less than a 1% chance that nuclear power plants in Poland will be added to the grid <laughs> before 2050. Well, I mean, I'm not sure where they get that precise figure of 1%, but... It's not precise. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an opinion, but still. Um, 
Yeah, I just, you know what? It bothers me though. If it was private companies doing yeah. it, that's one sure. thing. But it's always going to be governments. Yeah. I mean, here in Canada, we we're these SMRs that that may or may not, you know, from the fossil fuel conservative governments uh, that are driven by hanging on to fossil fuels with their buddies. Uh, are going to waste all of our money and, and bankrupt us uh, if if we let them, you know, keep doing this. Anyway, it's time for the Tweet of the Week. So Tony Siva, as you mentioned, is active. They've woken him up and dusted him off. He is our uh, sort of a guru to us. Uh, he is um, a pro climate, you know, green energy pro 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 prognosticator. Pro prognosticator, like the, like the gopher at... On, on on February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Um, he's that guy who's been doing it for 10 years, 12 years even. And it's ridiculous. Yeah, and he, and because, you know, his, his targets are still lining up. You know, his predictions yeah. are still there. And it's not, you know, hugely innovative stuff he's doing. It's, it's a cost curve. If... A new technology comes and you make enough of it, the cost of it goes down and the adoption of it goes up. Yeah, and I think the best statistic from all of his presentations, and he repeated this again in the ones that he just released on YouTube, is the transition from using the horse to using the car in North America in the early 20th century. And the bulk of it from like something like 10% penetration to 80% penetration happened in only 10 years. And that's in spite of the fact of there being basically no roads and no gas stations. And you know what? They, they asked people, what do you want? Do you want a car? They said, no, I want a faster horse. Yeah. But they didn't realize that a car was not only a faster horse, it wasn't a one-to-one -one comparison. It kept you dry and safe and warm and it didn't poop on you. <laughs> and, you know, things like that. Well, I had an AMC gremlin that did that, but that's another story. Let's let's not stretch it there. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a thing in his presentation where he showed newspaper headlines, headlines advocating for eating horse meat after the transition oh, started because there was too many Which is horses. exactly what happened. Yeah, all, you know, there, there was all these horses <laughs> that we no longer needed because everyone was driving cars and, you know, you literally people ate them. Oh, sounds stringy to me. I apologize to the horses out there. Uh, I know we have a few listening. Uh, so Victor uh, wrote to Tony on C Tony Sipo on Twitter. And he says, will smaller economies in Far East or Africa benefit more with this phase of the transformation uh, to solar? And Tony says, absolutely. Uh, when we uh, convert to solar power and green the uh, grid in Africa, they're basically leapfrogging from nothing right to solar. They don't have to build a bunch yeah. of power lines or a grid. They're just going to have localized solar, wind, and battery, and a superpower system without having to build an outdated grid. And because they're in Africa and close to the equator, uh, they're going to have the cheapest, you know, the best, the more sun you have, the more lower the cost of the solar per unit of electricity. So they'll have the cheapest electricity in the world in Africa. And you can, uh, with that, you can, in, you know, get investment. You can get industry investment. Where do you want to go? Where the cheapest electricity is, if you're using electricity for your company or corporation or factory or whatever. So just like many countries leapfrog to a, a cell phone infrastructure without having to build a line, landline uh, telephony system. So yeah. There's a lot of places in Africa that don't have landlines. They never did, yeah. and they, they have cell phones now, yeah. right? And they didn't need them, and it was good to just leapfrog. And he says, also, sunnier countries will have much lower cost of energy, and that does attract and improve the quality of life and solve many issues, such as transportation, uh, food, and water. So all that and desalination and the treatment of water will, uh, will help those countries, even if they're poor and don't have access to a lot of water. Hey, everyone, we like to hear from you. We like to hear from you all the time. Contact us at our Gmail address, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on TikTok with our handle, Clean Energy Pod. We're on YouTube. We have a handle there now where we never had one before. It's Clean Energy Show. And you can also leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. <laughs> Let 
means it's time for the lightning round. Brian, a fast-paced look at the week in clean energy and climate news. Beyond Meat is getting into plant-based steak. What do you think? Uh, you could eat that? Well, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll try it, sure. But the new product, meant to mimic an expensive cut of beef, arrives in over... 5,000 Kroger and Walmart locations across the United States soon, and it is also available at some Albertsons locations as well as other retailers. Each 10-ounce package contains seared plant-based steak tips in bite-sized pieces and is priced at $7.99. And the product is made of ingredients including fava beans and wheat gluten. So if you've got a gluten problem, look elsewhere for your fake beef fake steaks yeah i'm curious <laughs> okay you are fake steak curious officially uh, get that printed on a t-shirt someone uh, some of the models emphasized in gm's evs for everyone ad campaign which i keep seeing brian everywhere like the uh, blazer ev the equinox ev might not be widely available as soon as anticipated even though they're advertising the hell out of them they're pushing that back six months, so already we have a delay, and I'm not happy about yeah, that. Yeah, sounds like battery supply issues. Brazil's election is a major victory in the fight against climate change, according to many. Under Bolas Bol Bolsonaro, is it Bols Bolsonaro? Bolsonaro, yep. Bolsonaro. I don't even like saying his name. It's like saying Satan. Deforestation of the Amazon soared to a 15-year high, with scientists warning that the world's largest rainforest was nearing a tipping point beyond which there would be irreversible consequences to the entire planet. Uh, so this is good. It was a tight election. He has not conceded yet. Do you think he'll concede? Yeah, it doesn't sound good. I don't know. We'll see. I will see how that plays out as the future of other elections <clears throat> in 2024 happen. Uh, GMC Hummer EVs are sold out for two years or more. By the time you get one, There'll be old news. It'll be like, oh, that old thing. You know, I mean, that's that's a long time. It's true. There's a certain cool factor for these things, and cool factor doesn't last forever. Ooh, it's time for a CES Fast Fact. A 2019 study found that oceans had sucked up 90% of the heat gained by the planet between 1971 and 2010. Another found that it absorbed 20 sextillion joules of heat in 2020. And that is equivalent to two Hiroshima bombs per second. That doesn't sound good. It does not sound good. Uh, transportation as a service is going to be so cheap that you could take the cost of just gasoline, says Tony Siva, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, cost per mile is going to be higher than the total cost of transportation as a service just for gasoline. Carbon Tracker. Donors with fossil fuel links helped fund Rishi Sunak's race for PM. Yay for them. 25% of the 530 pounds donated to the new prime minister was from supporters with interests in oil, gas, and aviation, Brian. Yeah, so this is the new uh, UK prime minister, super rich guy, as you pointed out last week. Um, and yeah, I mean, lots of politicians are funded by fossil fuels, so we probably shouldn't be too surprised. So why didn't he fund his own damn thing so he's not beholden exactly. to anybody, you know, if you're that rich? Uh, King Charles to host the a reception ahead of COP27, despite not going himself because the government won't allow him. It will bring together 200 international business leaders, decision makers, and NGOs. And Brian, we still have not been invited. What? And I, I keep refreshing the inbox, but I nothing. I can't believe it. Uh, from Utility Dive, Texas Solar and Wind Resources saved consumers nearly $28 billion over the last 12 years. That means that the electricity consumed by Texans was $28 billion cheaper over 12 years because of renewables being in the grid. And that is growing rapidly. Yeah, Texas has more renewables, I think, than most people realize. Clean Technica, uh, Mercedes is going all in on electric. In general, the average lifespan for an automotive model is seven years. The Mercedes E-Class is due for an update next year, but, Brian, it's going to be its last. Wow. Mercedes plans to put out only battery electric new vehicles on the road by 2030 and will introduce only new electric platforms. 2025 is their last new combustion. I, of course, you and I know that's too late. You should cancel everything now, but it is a signal to 
the investment world and to the world. The Ram uh, all-electric pickup truck is going to debut at this year's Consumer Electronics Show. I guess that's everyone except for Toyota, Brian. Mm -hmm. That's all the pickup trucks now are going electric. And Toyota will be bankrupt by the time they make that announcement. From BBC News, switching to renewable energy could save trillions. An Oxford University study says, our central conclusion is that we should go full speed ahead with the green transition because it's going to save us money. And there's lots of studies on that coming out now. And you know, it's only going to get cheaper. Yeah. It's only going to save even more money. Prices as we go are dropping rapidly. Audi is cutting production of its flagship A8 luxury sedan. That's his main car. They're cutting production because everyone's buying the electric Audi e-tron battery electric vehicle. So they're increasing production of that one. Uh, electric. Jiping Motors has announced its latest EV has received a permit for autonomous driving tests on public roads, according to Chinese automaker. Uh, the G9 is the first unmodified Mass-produced commercial vehicle to qualify for such tests. So this is like Waymo doing tests in uh, San Francisco mm -hmm. and L.A. But they've got, you know, a million dollars worth of equipment rotating and radar and things on the roof. And you can see them from a mile away coming. Whereas the Jiping Motors uh, G9 is like a Tesla uh, in SUV form, small SUV. It's got all the sensors built in. And yet they've got... Um, you know, permission to do these robotaxi, robotaxi testing in streets of China, which I'm told are very hard to drive in at the times. And I saw a test, kind of like a FSD autopilot version. It did pretty well. I don't, I don't, it's, there was arguments in the comments about whether it was better or equal to Tesla, but it was kind of doing the same thing. Um, but they do have more sensors than Tesla does. Yeah, that's exciting. And that is our show for this week. We'd like to hear from you. Once again, I'm going to throw my email address out there. It is cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Drop everything. Write us a note now. We'd like to hear from you and uh, everywhere else. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel because that's going strong. And if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. And we leave you this week with the last paragraph of the New York Times Magazine article, Beyond Catastrophe, with a quote from renowned Canadian climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe on the future. We've come a long way, and we've still got a long way to go, says Hayhoe, the Canadian scientist, comparing the world's progress to a long hike. We're halfway there. Look at the great view behind you. We actually made it up halfway, and it was a hard slog. So take a breather, pat yourself on the back, but then look up. That's where we have to go. So let's keep on going. Well, I look forward to talking to you next week. See you next week.